good afternoon. I want to start with a few comments I've made about the global economy and our position within it. As you know, the Finance Minister is due back late tomorrow from his visit to the United States and where he's been talking to various people about the global outlook. I'll get a full update when he gets back, but I did have an opportunity to have a chat to him over the weekend, and it's fair to say he characterised the mood as very dark. There is genuine fear that both the United States and Europe uh, could be in for a tough time in the next 12 to 24 months. As the Reserve Bank Governor pointed out last week, the volatility in Europe and the United States is likely to reduce global growth. We are not immune from the current issues with the US and Europe. But New Zealand's position relative to many other economies is not all doom and gloom by any stretch of the imagination. This government has a plan to get our deficit and spending under control, and it's a plan we've been implementing since we came into government. You will remember uh, where we started when we took office. It had, if nothing had changed, we'd be facing never-ending deficits and ever-rising debt. Uh, this year is uh, it is likely that we will see government borrowing substantially reduced from around about $20 billion uh, to $5 billion, despite Canterbury earthquakes and reducing further in the coming years. The actions we have taken to get the country back into surplus as fast as possible is not only the right course of action, it's the only sensible course of action available to us. Moving on to the Rugby World Cup, it was a great weekend for the tournament and of course for the All Black captain Richie McCaw who played his 100th test for the All Blacks. Over 230,000 people attended matches over the weekend and ticket sales continue to be extremely strong. Organisation over the weekend was excellent, uh, the Auckland waterfront area and transport ran well and right across the country I'm advised that matches went off extremely well. Around 50,000 people visited Queen's Wharf during the day on Saturday and during the All Blacks match against France. Uh, Captain Cook's Wharf was open to handle the overflow from Queen's Wharf. We're heading towards a very special sporting weekend in New Zealand as we host some great matches in Rugby World Cup and as the Warriors go into battle in Sydney in the NRL Grand Final against Manly. Uh, for fans who can't get to Sydney, we are working on finalising plans for Aucklanders to be able to watch the Grand Final. Uh, final details such as locations are being worked through, uh, but it's likely that they'll be able to be announced in the next day or so. I'm pleased that the cooperative approach is being taken by both the IRB, our Rugby World Cup 2011, and the Auckland Council uh, to ensure we can cater for rugby union and rugby league fans on Sunday. In the Rugby World Cup, we have more sellout crowds coming this week. Uh, the Canada versus Japan match in Napier, Italy versus Ireland in Dunedin on Sunday, and South Africa versus Samoa at North Harbour on Friday. Uh, just uh, moving on to the search and surveillance uh, legislation or the uh, particular area, I'm sure you've already seen the statement by the Attorney General outlining the government's intended process on the bill to address the implications of the recent Supreme Court decision regarding covert video surveillance. Cabinet today discussed the matter and received briefings from both the Attorney General and the Minister of Police on the effect of the decision. It's clear that the decision has a serious effect on current operations involving the New Zealand Police. The offending in question is of a serious nature. It's also clear that the decision we have uh, will have an adverse effect on a number of prosecutions currently underway. While there, are, there may be uh, the potential to admit the video evidence in some of these trials through the Evidence Act, it still leaves prosecutors and police in the unpleasant position of having to present what has now been declared to be illegal evidence to the court and take their chances. Cabinet also received an update from the Attorney General on the extensive consultations he has conducted with other parties, the legal fraternity and other groups as, such as the Human Rights Commission. This has raised a number of issues, some of which the Attorney General has attempted to reflect in the bill. Others, of course, are reasonable differences of legal opinion. While the timing of this legislation has been less than ideal, uh, it is vital that we ensure the police cameras that are currently switched off uh, are switched back on as soon as possible. Therefore, it's our intention to introduce the legislation tomorrow under urgency and refer it to a select committee uh, with the committee reporting back next Monday. It would then be our intention, depending on parliamentary support, uh, to pass the reported back bill uh, through all remaining stages on Thursday next week. The ACT Party have indicated they will support the legislation to select committee. 
In terms of ministerial activity, um, I'm, I'm a caucus in question time. I'm meeting with the Vice President, uh, Premier of China, who's here during the afternoon. On Wednesday, I'll be hosting the Prime Minister of Georgia, uh, Nikolai Galauzi, uh, for our first bilateral meeting. We we'll both travel to Palmerston North uh, to watch the match between Georgia and uh, the Romanian teams that night. On Thursday, I'm in the Wairarapa, and then Friday, I'm in Auckland. At the weekend, I'm looking forward to going to Australia to attend, to attend the NRL Grand Final game between the Warriors and Manly. Unfortunately, this means I won't be able to attend the Rugby World Cup match being held in Dunedin on Sunday, as I'd planned. Um, tomorrow in the House, it's the government's intention to move the second reading of the Criminal Procedure Bill and the first reading of the Taxation um, Annual Rates Returns Filing and Remedial Matters Bill. Uh, the government will then move the urgency, uh, be accorded to the introduction of first readings of the video camera surveillance temporary measures bill as I just outlined and the sleepover wages settlement bill. This will enable them to be sent to select committee for a short consideration reporting uh, back on Monday and subject to continued support we will aim to commence debate on the remaining stages of these bills on Thursday the 6th of October which is the earliest opportunity understanding orders. Returning uh, to this week, Wednesday's Members Day, there will be seven valedictory statements made by retiring <coughs> members this week. Well, look at the negotiations that you're looking at in Auckland around Potential. Yep. Are you suggesting that the IRB have relaxed it enough so that they'll play the rugby league within Potential Central or take a big screen out of the street? Yes, so the uh, final details haven't been worked through. Um, they are a, a matter of negotiation now currently between the IRB, the Council and Rugby World Cup. But I think it's fair to say that all parties are trying to take a very constructive approach and I'm optimistic that we will get a solution that will work well for league fans as well as rugby fans. So they'll be able to watch? You're, you're confident that they'll be able to watch it in that area? There's, yeah, oh, look, I'm confident there will be a solution that will be amicable to all parties. They're, they're in the process of working that through and I wouldn't want to get in front of that, but it's looking optimistic. Are you looking at hiring new screen? Are you looking at hiring new screen? They'll work through all those details and we'll let you know that tomorrow. John Roche is pushing for the idea to legalise cannabis. Yeah. What do you make of that? I think it's a step completely in the wrong direction. Um, look, you know, Parliament sends messages through the actions it takes, and the message that I want to send to uh, New Zealanders is we want to see uh, less drug taking in this country. We don't want a drug culture for our young people. And um, I strongly disagree with him when he says that. Um, there's no demonstrated harm. In fact, the academic evidence strongly argues that there's considerable harm from sustained use of marijuana. Have you heard any other indications from Well, I think we're making progress. We're ironing out the different issues. I mean, I met with the Solicitor General on uh, Friday night. I know that um, there's been a number of meetings taking place. We're trying to make sure we give the parties uh, all the relevant information. Um, I'm very confident in the steps that we are taking, that they are the right steps. And I think what's very important to understand is it's Parliament's responsibility to set the laws. It's the court's responsibility to interpret the laws. And that was actually really the message that uh, came out of the Supreme Court ruling uh, on September the 2nd. Uh, they made it quite clear that Parliament needs to clarify its position. That's what the government's intending to do. So I can't guarantee we'll be able to get it out of the select committee and pass it, or I can't guarantee what form it'll be in, but I am confident that we're making good progress. So you're relying on expertise support Well, I think it's a matter for Labor to consider as well. I mean, at the end of the day here, um, it's pretty straightforward. If we don't get those cameras turned back on, then we are at risk, in my view, of having uh, a number of criminals who won't uh, be brought to justice. Uh, there are serious cases involved here. And uh, in my view, uh, I think that would be a you know, very uh, negative step. And actually, uh, Parliament relied very heavily uh, and on the, the rulings of the, the Appeal Court of Appeal. I read a number of those judgments that the, um, the Crown Sister provided for me on Friday. Uh, and those, those judgments from the Court of Appeal were very clear uh, that um, uh, video surveillance uh, was admissible and we had no particular reason as a result of at least those decisions and the common law rulings over the last 15 years to consider that to be anything other than a lawful position. Maybe there's an issue with the retrospectivity of it. Is there any chance that um, the government's legislation would just be picking and future cases that already exist and then just putting it into the retrospective nature um, critical to, to the legislation we want to pass? 
Well, it's always possible that it could just simply be prospective in nature, uh, but that would certainly have an impact on the 40 odd trials that we want to uh, bring to, to court. Um, the advice from uh, Solicitor General to me was that uh, 40 is on the light side um, and uh, serious cases, so we'd certainly want to see that. There are also potentially issues of um, you know, people uh, who have been convicted uh, then taking an appeal, so that's not to be underestimated. So, of course, it's always possible it's prospective and not retrospective, but I think we need to look at both. Will the government release right? the advice that it's actually detailed the advice it's received from oh, Crown Law? Look, it's not normal for us to release Crown Law opinions, but uh, the, the, the Solicitor General has been meeting, as I understand, with other political parties. Um, so. My right. understanding is that the parties actually haven't seen a copy of the advice yet. Will it be given to them so they can make an informed decision ahead of the debate? Yeah, it does, in general. This case uh, though, was, was about placing hidden cameras on someone else's property That's right. without their knowledge or consent. Are you seriously saying that the common law allowed that? Yes. And do you think that's the way it should be going? Well, all, all I can say to you is I can, I'm more than happy to provide you uh, with the court uh, rulings uh, that came out of the Court of Appeal, it's very, very clear. Were they not just about ordinary hidden cameras, though? No. Have you got a brief in detail on the cases where police found their surveillance has been turned off right now? And can you describe some of those? Well, my understanding is that they're serious um, drug cases um, and other uh, potential offences that would lead to um, potentially life imprisonment. Significant cases. Are you confident that actually get a, just the fact that you're going ahead with the first reading and the city committee here and suggest that you are confident that you should get in the numbers? I think I'm just quite more as hopeful. Um, it's a serious issue and it needs to be addressed. So, in those cases that you're talking about, the serious um, cases that would lead to life imprisonment and um, drug cases, etc., has, has the filming been turned off? Absolutely. Look, the, 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 the judgment from the Supreme Court on this split decision was it was unlawful. At that point, the police obviously need to follow the law and they, they've switched those, um, those that, that filming off. Now, um, you know, we need to get those cameras turned back on. So that includes a perspective some of the that that has been captured. Sorry, Mark? Well, not what I'm saying. The footage that, that has been captured to date, even if this law is retrospective, that there's still a doubt that it will be admissible or no, not if we pass the legislation as proposed. Are you concerned that you've lost a lot of footage that would have been actual to their places in the interim? We've unquestionably lost some. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think it's important to understand that this kind of video surveillance footage has been gathered for 15 years. This isn't new technology. It supports a lot of cases. It's not the only form of evidence that the police use, uh, but it's an important part of the the picture that they present when they go to court to support the case that they're taking. So would you, you would dispute the claim that the police knew that what they were doing was unlawful? Are you saying oh, they, uh, they thought it was legal? Utterly, I'm happy to get you the, the Crown Law opinion, I mean it's a matter of public record, uh, but the, sorry, the, 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 court, the case that this, the uh, Solicitor General brought to me, but it's quite clear, the clause absolutely says in the judgement that um, that they've relied on this video surveillance and it is admissible to the court. But surely the, the whole Law Commission's process and the search and surveillance bill process, that was, that was indicating that there were problems in this area and it wasn't on solid ground. Yep, but that's the, that's the Law Commission's view in 2007. The Court of Appeals ruling in 2009 was quite clear. Can I ask you a question on um, the League versus the Rugby? Yep. Are the negotiations that are underway but, um, between the IRB and the Rugby World Cup 2011, is that for fan zones right across the country or just in the Auckland? Auckland, I think. And any, any plans to do it for any wider than that? I haven't been advised of that, but I um, mean, that's as <coughs> always possible at this point, but I've only been advised of this for them. What are you going to be talking to the Chinese Vice Premier about? Uh, well, he's a member of the Politburo, so uh, very senior. And I mean, firstly, it's just generally our relationship with China. Um, you know, the, the areas where we're looking to grow our relationship, uh, which is obviously economically we're looking to advance uh, issues there. Uh, it'll be interesting to get an update on how he thinks the Chinese economy is travelling. I mean, that's a critical part of 
of the success, I would argue, of the Australian economy and, and, and very directly the New Zealand economy. Uh, they are the second largest market now, so clearly it could be that economic side of things. Um, you know, we, could, you know, we may raise other issues with him, um, but we'll see now. When you talked about the um, very dark times in Europe and America, yep. um, have you um, received any information that you will have to revise down to economic growth and um, job growth targets? Well, nothing other than when I met the Reserve Bank Governor last week, as I, you know, I do from time to time, the indication that he had at that point was that global growth will be reduced by about half, half a percent, so I think it's going from 3.7 to 3.2, something like that. So, I mean, Jerry, what he was saying is it will have some impact on New Zealand, but at this point, it's you know it's not significantly material, so it has an impact. But I mean, of course, you know, in the end, the United States is a third of the global economy. Europe is a huge trading powerhouse. So, if those economies are weaker for longer, that has an impact on New Zealand. Um, the lucky part of the story from New Zealand's perspective is that Asia has been emerging very strongly. It's so far been somewhat immune to what's, what's happening in the United States and Europe. And if they can remain strong, and the indications are that they'll continue to grow between sort of 8 and 9%, uh, then that's um, very good for New Zealand. I think um, Mr. English met with, I think it was, was the Chinese finance minister when he was in Washington, who again was you know, optimistic that the Chinese economy would continue to grow at you know, those sort of 8 to 10% levels. Those numbers that the Reserve Bank Governor referred to, presumably they're on the basis of what's happened. Um, do you have any uh, advice or any indication of the impact of, say, a default by Greece on the New Zealand default? No, but I mean, I think that the, the issue is, oh, I mean, one thing that the finance minister said to me is that um, his, his impression is, unlike the late 2008, early 2009, where there was um, significant stress in the financial markets and the, the funding markets effectively closed, they closed to New Zealand, closed to most countries around the world. The situation is far more discerning now, so it's particular institutions and particular countries that are much more badly affected. So there's some impact on liquidity, but not it's not wholesale. Um, from New Zealand's point of view, I mean, we borrowed $20 billion last year, you know, a big chunk of that for the Christchurch earthquake. This year it's $5 billion, and we've largely pre-funded ourselves. So we're in a vastly different position. I mean, I still think our corporate balance sheets are much stronger. Um, we're, in, we're in better shape in terms of commodity prices. So, I mean, I, look, we're not immune from what's happening in the world, but most countries would trade their position with New Zealand and take our position any day. Do you, what's your reading on the, the likelihood of the default? I mean, Mr. English has been there, so presumably he's had the word on the ground. Um, he's um, come away with a very, very gloomy outlook by the sound of it. He didn't offer a view on the call yesterday, but I'd say better than 50%. Better than 50%. Because the default. Yep. Because today, um, there's an interview with Angela Merkel
the challenges they were working their way through. We haven't made that decision. Was, was the cost of that Essentially, long that was not all of the million KiwiSaver or not all of the million New Zealand workers who aren't in KiwiSaver would, would stay in the scheme. I mean, a reasonable number of people um, opt out of KiwiSaver because it simply doesn't suit their circumstances. And, and that's one of the challenges with compulsion. It's a nice idea, but everyone has their own set of circumstances that they need to manage through. And so it just doesn't suit everybody. Uh, and you would be arguably uh, putting more stress on their on their household than otherwise they might want to happen. How much would it cost though? Well, sort of we're not, I'm not in a position to release that yet. It's, I mean, it's hundreds of millions, but it's not billions. Professor, are you concerned at all that the, the function bid for the paper farm has now been stuck with the LAO for five months? Uh, I'm not concerned by that. I mean, I don't have a view on why it's taking that time. They're independent. They make their call and eventually make a recommendation to ministers. And I can be involved in that process other than recognising it's in front of the OIO. I just wonder if the Chinese Deputy Premier has visit tomorrow and the uh, surprising local, uh, surprising points from the Chinese Embassy on that issue some weeks ago, yep. he might not expect that to come up. He might raise it, but we'll let you know tomorrow. Five months later. What would you tell him? I'd tell him we go through a process in New Zealand and um, the government has changed recently uh, the Overseas Investment Act uh, to try and get greater clarity to the outcome we want to see, and that we expect people to work their way through that process. It's an open process as, as uh, much as these things are possible, but it takes some time. Five months, that's not a very good advertisement for enticing foreign investment to New Zealand, is it? It's a complex position. What's the nature of the agreements that will be signed for the vice premier? I don't know all those details at this stage. He's meeting, the meeting's hosted by Bill English. Well, well, it's it's actually complex about the function that it's a, it's an apparent director. You need to go and ask the overseas investment office that. But have they told you it's complicated? No, they don't agree with me what they're doing. Well, then how come you think it's complicated? Well, there's no evidence in that area is complex. Back on the economy, um, yep. Wayne Swan um, today, this morning I think, said that the world economy is making it much harder for Australia to hit its target of yep. returning to service by 12 13. Yep. Um, your comment on the situation in New Zealand? Well, I haven't been advised that. Is any need for us to change from our current position, which is 14 15. Uh, we've quietly been hopeful that we might get there slightly earlier. Um, that, that might now mean that that's not possible and we're at 14 15 again. I mean, in the end, um, we've just got to work through the situation as we find ourselves. I mean, one bit of good news, at least for New Zealand and Australia at the moment, is that the exchange rate's falling. That's helping our exporters a little bit. Obviously, puts pressure on other areas, but in Australia's case, we've had quite a significant devaluation in the last few days, and so have we. But I mean, they were at 1019 and they were at 197 cents. Mr. English apparently, uh, when he was over in the States, uh, said that in a general sense, um, governments would need to trim back the spending a bit and perhaps bump up their taxation a little bit more. Would you say New Zealand's anywhere near coming into that camp, particularly on the taxation side? Well, I think we're happy with what we're doing on the tax side. I mean, uh, the structure of the tax system and the integrity of the tax system is critically important. I mean, you wouldn't want to play around with that unless you ultimately needed to. And our main concern about the sort of proposals that Labor put up is that they fundamentally alter the integrity of the system. And we think that the, uh, the bureaucracy involved in administering things like GST or food mean that uh, they rule those policies out. And that was the long-standing view of Labor. And that was Phil Goff's view when he was on the committee that looked at the introduction of GST in New Zealand. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's a policy you might want to take to the election when you're behind in the polls, but it's not practically a policy you want to implement. Because if you want to take GST off fruit and vegetables, why would you take it off meat and milk? And then and the bureaucracy and the administration of that would be enormous. So I don't see us, you know, advocating significant changes in tax. In terms of spending, we are being um, very careful. When we've cut our new budget spending uh, allowance to $800 million. Uh, We've had a number of, of, of um, budget ministers' meetings already uh, looking at make sure, making sure that we're returned as the government we hit that target. So we're very focused on that. Do you stand ready to make any changes, any specific uh, ideas for any changes that's uh, the future to custody in Greece or elsewhere in Europe? Well the government always has to respond. I mean, when we came in two, back into 2008, you'll remember when we got the pre uh just before the election, um, there was a picture that was um, substantially, had substantially deteriorated from budget time. 
as soon as we became the government, Treasury felt the numbers were so badly out of date within that six week period, they presented a new set of books and ultimately we cancelled the tax cuts that we were proposing to have in 2009. So you always have to respond as, as government and as Prime Minister I've learned that you do the best um, to keep your word, uh, but people also expect you to, to roll with punches to a certain degree. So there can always be change, but on the information I have today, in good faith, we're promoting the policies we have. I don't think so at the moment. I mean, look, I mean, Q2 growth was a little, a little weaker than the expectation or the consensus from economists, but we've grown in eight of the last nine quarters. I mean, Q1 was upgraded. Um, the government said to me he was pretty confident that Q3 and Q4 would be considerably stronger. We have the domestic stimulus that will come from the Christchurch rebuild, and while it's been pushed slightly further out, it's a very substantial amount of economic activity that will take place. I mean, the exchange rate, you know, if it comes down a bit more, helps us on the competitive side. Commodity prices remain strong. So I, mean, I think, you know, from New Zealand's point of view, we're lucky to sell the things the world wants to buy. And we're in the right part of the world probably for the first time in a long time. So, of course, we're not immune. Uh, but we're very focused on getting ourselves back into surplus as fast as we can, paying off debt and making the economy as competitive as we can. In the end, we can only control the things that are within our grasp and what happens around the rest of the world. You know, we just need to work our way through that. And you know, as Bill English has said, you know, it's, it's choppy waters at the moment, and the waters are getting choppier. Do you think there could be a, a global double dip? People die in terms of dangers over there? Yeah, look, it's possible. Uh, but I don't think that seemed to be the likely outcome. Most people seem to think it will be, you know, it'll be very challenging over the next 24 months, but not necessarily a double dip recession. But it depends again whether it's a technical recession. And global growth is still predicted to be about 3%. Terry said, ESOS, Peter Bank, not today. I thought I'd credit this out in the final. So, see if it's a CEO and the number of tax partners. He would do, yes, that's right. Well, I think what it means is the likelihood of the taxpayer being uh, re refunded their money uh, is substantially reduced, and any, any repayment they get uh, will be substantially less than 100 cents in the dollar. How much, I don't know. That's ultimately a matter for receivers, but, but you know, it's a loss to the New Zealand taxpayer. Have you had any recent advice about how much the recovery might be from this no. year? I mean, I can guess that well, I'll ultimately just be appointing the receiver now that he's been adjudicated bankrupt. Oh, so generally from... Oh, generally, uh, no, I haven't had the most recent numbers. What importance do you attach to uh, Imran Khan's uh, views on the situation in Afghanistan? Well, Pakistan's a player um, in that part of the world, and they ultimately need to be part of the long-term solution in Afghanistan. Uh, but, you know, my view of it is that uh, this was a UN-sanctioned operation, and, yes, history doesn't tell a very good story in Afghanistan, but... Um, history also tells a terrible story of thousands of people that lost their lives in 9 11. And the world had to act and didn't act in it. Have you been briefed that Pakistan might be behind some of the recent sieges that the SAS have been involved in? in well, I haven't had any advice on that. Um, okay. on, on Rugby World Cup, sure. uh, I think you said extremely strong ticket sales, but not able to give us an update on uh, getting closer to that target at this point. It's getting pretty close. I mean, the Rugby World Cup. Saturday night, and, and the numbers are looking really good. Under 10 million? It was close to that, I think, on, on um, Saturday night. But I think there's two important points to remember. One is part of that would include sales that haven't taken place for the final. Um, and I think for the, for the semis, they will be sold out. And the second thing is that the target, don't forget, is actually still below capacity. So one of the important messages we're trying to get through to New Zealanders is, is just because we hit our target, that's the target of the anticipated loss. Doesn't mean there aren't tickets. What are the chances of a break even? Because the IOB is still pretty close to being on the best world cups. They are, yeah. Behind off the field. Yeah. So, um, who's not on the side? So, what are the chances? Yeah, we've got a possible we've, break even for a we've, we've, we've moved on from that one, yeah. 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 So what, by bus and by train, by body. So, what do you think the chances of a break even are? Uh, not high. I mean, none of the advice I've had is that, that uh, we'll, we'll break even. But we, might do, we, might do, we might do a little bit better than the $39 million loss. Just on the Act Party, um, yeah. if you're still looking at um, you know, doing some sort of uh, deal with John Banks, I mean, you just work it for these guys, they just seem to be a complete joke. Well, in the end, 
that's in the hands of the voting public what ultimately happens. And all we can do is go to the election uh, booth on November 26th with the rest of New Zealand and see what cards are dealt. I guess I'm asking how they were so. <laughs> or, in the end, we're going to sit down after the election and talk to the parties that we've indicated if they're back in Parliament. But before the election, you do an accommodation to ensure that they're there after? Well, what we've indicated is we're a, a primarily party vote campaign in Epsom. It doesn't mean that Epsom voters follow that strategy. That in the end is their hand. Do you but think that Dr. Rashi is bringing this up as the national party in the caucuses or the end? Not to my recollection. No. It doesn't sound like he's raised it with the act caucus on it. Did you get any warning that John Moscow was going to announce this? He sent me a text um, just on Saturday afternoon just before the public announcement. And I thanked him obviously for his contribution as time as a minister. I'm surprised. I was really surprised. Yeah, I mean, I actually think he's he's done a good job. I mean, in the time that he's been effectively the parliamentary leader, we've had more interaction with him, or we have people as a minister, but obviously in recent times, he's pretty straightforward. He's got a good sense of what he can deliver and what he can't. Um, I think it'll be a loss actually for him. What's it say about the party that goes into the election? None of it's sitting in peace, seeking. Clean sweep. <laughs> I'll leave you guys to a pine on that. That's what you paid the big bucks for. Thanks very much. See you later.